Hi everyone, welcome to Procall Podcast. Today I have uh, Ash Shetty with us. Uh, Ash is a CPO of Montgomery County, and uh, he manages a spend of couple billion dollars. And uh, he's been, and we're lucky to have him today uh, on Procall's podcast. As a background, Procall is a next generation spend management uh, procurement technology company, and. Um, Yeah, we are excited to learn more about Ash on his journey and experience uh, as a leader. Ash, I would love to start off with um, you know introducing you to the audience. Uh, if you could you know introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. It was great meeting you in ProcureCon, and then you know having the the ability to set up this call for us to to discuss procurement, one of my passions. Uh, my name is Ash. I have uh, been the Chief Procurement Officer of Montgomery County, Maryland, for about five years. Uh, Montgomery County is a suburb of Washington D.C. It's a, a relatively large community uh, by American standards of over one million people. We spend uh, one and a half billion dollars a year. Uh, we have an overall spend under management of five billion dollars. And uh, yeah, if if you know anything about local government, we deal with all sorts of urgent matters, everything from buying uh, large buses and fire trucks to buying things as uh, tiny as paper pins for our for our offices, or even bullets for the guns that our police officers will use. Very interesting. Uh, I would love to hear more about your journey on where you started in procurement. And we understand where you are now, but how did you get into this? Sure. So I don't think that my journey is particularly typical or atypical or or um, special in any way. In that I uh, started off as a management consultant. I worked with many companies and category managers on specific challenges that they had, and you know it was one of those things which you you get to solve a lot of problems for a lot of people. Uh, in a very quick amount of time, and and it was a very interesting experience. And then, after almost a decade of doing that uh, and rising through the ranks, and you know having various responsibilities, including at one point managing our practice in Europe, and I actually had to relocate there for a while. Uh, I decided to take a position as a practitioner and became the chief procurement officer here in Montgomery County. Uh, I'd say the one thing that's unique about it, though, is unlike a lot of people who will tell you that they ended up in procurement somehow and it's sort of like it just happened to them, I think I made a very deliberate decision here. When you think about it, you ask most people, you know, when they're like in college or even getting their MBA, how many of you want to be a CEO? You'll have half the class, at least an MBA case. Uh, in the case of a business school, raise their hands. But if you ask people in, um, you know. Honestly, do you want to work in procurement? When I was studying, most people probably didn't realize that was a function. Uh, but if they did, it wasn't their first choice yet. What I realized is that procurement is is a very interesting function. It is simultaneously the most externally oriented function in a company. Like it, you deal with uh, vendors, you deal with uh, regulators, you need to understand market trends. Uh, but then at the same time, when you list the most internally oriented companies. Parts of a, an organization, you'll think maybe HR, uh, but very quickly you'll say procurement because procurement has to understand all the departments, their constraints, their their concerns, their priorities, even the egos and politics within the departments. And you think about that—that that is the most internally and externally oriented role in in any organization. And to be honest with you, I'd say it's right up there with the CEO, who has to worry about the board of directors, shareholders, employees, unions, if that's the case. And it's a it's it's to me the closest you can get to being the CEO in a space where nobody wants to compete with you because nobody seems interested in in our beautiful function. So I've I've really enjoyed the last fifteen years now almost sixteen years in procurement that I've uh, uh, that I've built a career in it. Fascinating. I want to start off with I think acknowledging the fact that most of our audience has. Looked at private procurement mostly. Public procurement is a completely different beast, and I believe that uh, it would be great to start off by understanding your top three biggest challenges as a public procurement leader. 
context with context i think will be good yeah. for people too no absolutely so i and i appreciate that 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 context so i would say that when you think about it really once an organization reaches a certain scale and size and complexity in all honesty the industry starts to become less and less relevant in the procurement space because you end up finding that you're basically dealing with the same challenges around procurement speed around risk management around internal customer satisfaction around you know vendor uh, relationship management whether what you want from them is a competitive advantage or just a steady supply uh, it it starts to come down to very similar themes uh, but in terms of my three biggest challenges um obviously one is this idea that procurement as a function is very often under utilized and even undervalued and so when you have a sudden shock to the system and it could be anything it could be a sudden geopolitical conflict like they're having in ukraine and the middle east today or it could be something like covid all of a sudden you realize that you do need procurement it is a very important function and perhaps a function that was not valued correctly uh so one of my challenges i would say has always been elevating the stature of the procurement function uh and that remains a challenge it is something that um you know i i've always been ad- an advocate for this function but i think uh, especially in the world post covid where where we really had very deep involvement with all aspects of operations during the pandemic uh i've tried to leverage that position now to to gain more resources and and honestly to have a team that is able to deal with future uh shocks like covid or or god knows what else we have coming um the other i would say is probably one that a lot of folks face uh but it has to do with restaffing um uh, in my case right after the pandemic i'd say throughout the pandemic but especially after the pandemic i i had such a significant turnover that almost um like all except one of my managers was replaced so i i have seven or eight managers and only one of them is is from pre covid and more than 50% of my team turned over and this is just i think a phenomenon in in government maybe where a lot of people are reaching retirement age a covid phenomenon but whatever it was my big issue was identifying talent attracting that talent again keeping in mind that this is government and it's you know not necessarily for everybody um and also this idea of uh how do i now upskill this talent and and like you know in the case of the the, the managers thing that i mentioned i found myself now working with very capable individuals who had for the first time in their careers become managers five of them and i'd often when they'd ask me for for guidance or advice i'd tell them that this is what i would do but it occurred to me that what i would do isn't playing to their strengths it's playing to my strengths so i started to change that conversation to be what would i do if i were in their shoes how would i develop if i were them and it took me to the point where last year i actually took myself through some leadership development i i i took a couple of courses in in coaching uh just so that i could be more effective at managing my new managers uh but that 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 was a challenge that i thought was an interesting way to overcome it it required me to have empathy for my staff but also a little bit of self awareness for where i was struggling um and then the the last one i would talk about in in terms of the uh the three challenges as 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 you asked uh would be simply uh how do you continue to push the goals where you are achieving some success but you still need to do better so that idea of you know you reach a certain point where you can have change but the the marginal change is slower you're going to see diminishing returns um in my case a big part of our values is spending money locally uh spending money with minorities and it's just that constant challenge of how do i reengage the community how do i find new ways to 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 keep that momentum going um and that maybe is one of those that is particularly specific to government i don't know that uh, a lot of folks in the private sector would list diversity spend as one of their top priorities but it is one for me right no i think the points that you mentioned are quite relevant in today's time i often talk to teams where the benchmark data is set and pushing boundaries become difficult so completely relate with the third point as well yeah. moving moving to the next question 
what are the solutions as aligned to your problems uh, that you're considering for 2024? And yeah, what does 2024 look like for you? So 2024 is going to be one of those things where you are um, thinking about how do you, you know, everybody's talking about leveraging AI better. Um, how do you take advantage of these new technologies? I, I posted on LinkedIn recently that I took our procurement playbook uh, and and essentially trained a generative AI tool to answer questions at the eighth grade level. So if you ask it, how do I do business with this county or what does the selection process looks like look like? It'll actually give you these really simple answers. And what's really cool is it'll answer them in multiple languages, which which is is also helpful. Uh, but you think about now, what else can I do with this technology? Because I think we're just scratching the surface and this technology is going to be disruptive. Um, the back end of that same topic is you also have to be very mindful of whether you are working with your vendors in a way that is accommodating their use of artificial intelligence. In other words, what are the data privacy uh, and legal concerns that we ought to have as, as contracting officers that have to do with protecting our interests from a still burgeoning and somewhat ambiguous use case for data, right? Uh, so that's another, another area where I think I'm going to spend a lot of time thinking through, yes, let's use and harness AI, but let's also make sure that we are protecting what needs protecting. Uh, and then the last in terms of my challenges is is something that I, I alluded to earlier, which is this idea of trying to take my new team and transferring their value proposition from uh, something that may be seen as oversight to something that is seen as insight, uh, rather than simply making sure that they're doing the procurement function and checking the boxes of what steps need to be followed, that these these very talented individuals are now actually using their critical thinking skills, their ability to connect dots that nobody else can see uh, and provide value that is beyond just the process hygiene uh, value that they provide. Um, you know, it's this idea of simply trying to elevate the function from being seen as a compliance function to a consultant function within the organization. Interesting that you want to change the narrative entirely, you know, uh, and in my just previous podcast, uh, I think the gentleman talked about how um, be, becoming a problem solver is the key for procurement practitioners uh, to keep their value and innovating constantly as a procurement practitioner. Otherwise, going in the same uh, field every day, doing the same thing every day, uh, you need more challenges. And I think just re repositioning procurement teams Definitely helps. Yeah, you know, and I, it's it's funny that 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 idea, right, of taking proactive ownership of problems anywhere you see them, it's something that very few organizations are in a position to do because again, they are focused on very specific silos. But like I was saying earlier, what drew me to this function is that we see everything, we touch everything, we can connect dots that if we're not connecting, nobody else is going to even see them to be able to connect them. So. You do have to have that that proactive mindset of 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 problem solving, though. Where I've found very often procurement maybe falls short is either they don't see that as part of their job, or they see themselves as issue spotters instead of problem solvers. And really, if we are going to be adding value, we should be solving those problems. And 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 you know, so like you were saying in your previous podcast, I think most astute procurement executives will realize that that is the opportunity for procurement. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think what you had showed me uh, on the previous call on uh, the kind of practices you have already adopted, um, being transparent, I think you already influenced a lot of new things that I don't think the world has still seen. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's, that's commendable, right? Uh, I'd love if you can, you know, provide insights to the audience on what what transformation you've already done so that they have context on these solutions are actually way beyond what you've already done. Yeah, uh, and thank you for that. Um, so a couple of things there. 
the first and foremost is when you think about any organization, when you step into it, it's very important for your team to understand where you're going, what your vision is, what direction you want to provide. Uh, you know, I used to ask this interview question about uh, how would you describe a well-functioning organization? And it occurred to me that I'd never actually thought about the answer to that question myself. Like I asked the question of other people, but what, how would I define it? And my ultimate answer was it is where everybody understands the mission and everybody feels empowered having understood the mission as an independent leader to help achieve it. And the other part of that, and they go hand in hand, is if they're going to feel empowered as leaders, what are the guardrails that you put that allow them to perform at that level? And what I, that was the other def deficiency I noted, is we didn't have a set of core values. Uh, core values are not just these things, these flowery things you put on a wall or a poster. These are actually things that will shape how decisions are made. It will shape how people carry themselves in the workplace, and it'll basically shape your your interactions with each other. And so we identified four values. We came up with uh, efficiency, because I always knew we'd have to do more with less, and clearly COVID proved that true, uh, that we would have to be empathetic, because uh, otherwise procurement is seen as a sort of monolith that just says yes or no, in fact, more often no, uh, that we would also have to be collaborative. And because we work for the government, we'd have to be transparent. So. With that in mind, all the tools that were developed were designed to help us achieve the goals that I set for my team and in the way that the values would would, would say was, in, was in, they were consistent with one another. So one of the tools that I showed you was our uh, procurement tracker. In fact, to this day, if you Google the word solicitation tracker, it's the only one that comes up. Uh, and it's a very user-friendly tool because as soon as you start to type in what you're looking for, it'll give you the options. And if you click on any random one, what it'll show you is how you can follow where a solicitation is in its life cycle with us. Very often vendors will tell you their biggest source of anxiety is they put their hearts and dreams into this solicitation response, and then they don't hear back quickly or they don't hear back at all. Sometimes they find out somebody else won it. In our case, you can obviously reach out to my, 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 my officers, but you could also just enter the name of what solicitation you applied to and it'll tell you what step of the process it is in. It'll tell you whether there's a delay or if it's going on time. Um, it'll simply address whatever anxiety you have. And if it doesn't, right alongside it is the contact information for the people you need to reach out to if you want to talk to somebody. So we're not trying to hide behind the technology, but at the same time, recognizing that people have this anxiety around the status of their procurements. We put it out there. And what's cool is it also memorializes past procurements. So you can see various details about that procurement that would be helpful if you were bidding in a future instance. Uh, and another tool very quickly, just to, you know, I can talk endlessly about these tools. I think in the in my last five years at this job, we've won nine national awards for these types of tools. But, um, and just to put that in context, in the last 20 years before that, the officer only won three of these awards. So we've clearly ramped up our ability to deliver on innovation. But, um, but the other tool I'll tell you about is, I used to have a lot of people reaching out to me uh, wanting to sell what they do to the government. But honestly, procurement folks are responsible for the procurement process, not for the buying decisions that various departments would make. We lack the subject matter expertise, essentially. So if you've got this great solution for how to manage waste or how to manage you know, anything like fleet utility, a uh, better software, uh, what we did is we created this thing called the Vendor Innovation Portal, which allows you to share with us not only your ideas, but also showcase how your ideas may be good for us in terms of savings, good for us in terms of environmental impact, good for us in terms of diversity or equity. Uh, just give you the opportunity to put your best foot forward, and then we would present that to the departments on your behalf. Uh, so just tools, again, to help people get what they need done, get it to the right people. Um, you know, my most embarrassing innovation was we put a calendar up on our website, which gives you dates for when opportunities are coming to you. And a lot of people were like, wow, this allows us to align to what dates, you know, like basically see what's coming and plan our lives accordingly. This is so innovative. And I always joke that, you know, calendars have been around since like before Julius Caesar. This is not innovative. It's just empathetic that I'm putting it out there. and You can see what I'm going to be doing and when.
Uh, but yeah, uh, thank you for acknowledging those those things I showed you. They were just, you know, a few of the, the tweaks we made here that have had very positive impact. Yeah, thank you again for sharing those insights. Uh, I also want to take a moment to, you know, recognize that many companies or practitioners that are watching this work at companies of different sizes. Um, and so they have uh, different types of experiences with procurement technology and tools that can automate procurement functions. So just to understand from you, when is, when should a young company consider adopting a digital procurement tool and what tools should they consider initially? So this is probably a question that as a former management consultant, I would have had the most fun with um, because, you know, it's not a simple answer. Uh, it's not like, hey, when you hit this pen number, you should have adopted uh, procurement technologies to streamline your your your, your processes. Um, I, I'm sure there is a number where if you hit it and you've not yet automated, it's already too late. But I don't know that there is a floor number where you, this is when you need to get in. Uh, but I think you know it is a it is a risk play. It depends on 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 the extent to which risk management is a priority. It it probably is a play of the complexity of your processes and your organization. As a matter of fact. Uh, potentially also a complexity play in terms of the categories of spend that you manage, the, the types of things that you buy. Um, but I think if I had to give you my philosophical answer to this question, it would be when the procurement function has decided that it has graduated from being a backroom function and it is time for it to become a boardroom function. When it realizes the value of procurement is not in the tactical aspects of purchasing, but in the strategic aspects of, of procurement, uh, where you are now creating outsized value for your organization because you're not doing the tedious work that could have been automated, but brute forcing it. Instead, you've decided your value proposition is in having that automated, streamlined, and now focusing on what insights you can deliver or what value you can deliver from that that process so um you know it, it'll come down to more than just um uh, your technology needs it will it will probably be your understanding your resourcing and your capabilities from a staff's perspective understanding your processes and any deficiencies you may have uh and then of course your current state or whatever tools you use in technology um at, as a minimum starting point, what I would recommend is at least get a workflow management tool. Uh, the reason behind this is it will allow you to understand what specific steps are bottlenecks in your process that maybe need further automation or, or leveraging of technology. Or it will make you aware of what capabilities you need to develop, whether it is through other investments in, in, in talent or, or process modification. But the point is, it'll give you a starting point to identify exactly what your pain points are. Right. Yeah, that is very insightful. Workflow management tool, right? Um, what what all workflows should they consider uh, automating or digitizing at the very so, beginning? Because, because this can get very messy from it, off. It off does. And, and my take on this has been start at the highest view and then start zeroing down closer to the problems as you identify them. So at the at the highest level, what we look at is when a department is interested in making a beginning a procurement and they send us essentially the request like, hey, we've secured the budget, we want to buy X, Y, Z. From that time onwards, what are the processes that you go through to walk them to the point where a contract is signed and services can be delivered, requisitions can be cut off of it? That there's depending again on how matrixed your organization is or or how how it's structured in terms of geographies or or business units uh, or categories even uh, it will create its own variations but that would be the the entry level model because it will basically allow you to understand how you provide value to your business partners starting off Eventually, you will probably need to also look into things like your rec to check process, your 
and that goes into risk management and other things. Um, but I think starting at a high altitude and then working your way down to the minutia is is more efficient than simply starting in some random location and saying, what are we doing here? Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. Covering as much as possible from the offset could be very important. And it gives visibility and to, uh, to other stakeholders who also care, right? In terms of, like the number one question I used to get asked even internally is, where's my stuff? You know, the, and, and the, the simple answer would have been look in the systems, but if that is not something that they can find, then you need to show them what is happening. Uh, I often say it's like if you travel in Uber and there's a map that's showing you where you're going and how much time is left, even if there is a delay, the person feels less frustration because there's some sense of control. Like I can see on this map where I am, how much time is left, and they're okay with it. They understand that there's traffic or whatever. Uh, but if you can't provide that level of visibility or you don't even have that visibility for yourself, it's going to be really hard to manage the function. All right. Um, lastly, I just want to also uh, get our audience as much value as they can. And, you know, the final thing I'd ask you is what advice would you give to young procurement professionals who want to become CPOs um, managing uh, multi-billion dollar spend in a couple of years. Okay, so that's a that's a heavy question just because it requires you to think, you know, about the journey you've had and what are the things that worked for you and what are the things that haven't worked for you. And I think my first piece of advice would be know for sure that procurement is what you want to do. Um, I have a... a embarrassingly a love for this function even when i'm not doing my work i'm on linkedin writing comments about it just you know constantly thinking about things even in my spare time having to do with this function and i don't know if that makes me a geek or a nerd but the point is i i love what i do and that is an important thing because uh otherwise you're going to find even if you get to the top of this function that you're not getting any satisfaction from it you know it, it's not it's not scratching that itch that you have in life. And, you know, that could be anything. It could be uh, an intellectual curiosity. It could be um, the desire to do good for society, whatever it is. Make sure that procurement is the space. Don't rise to the top of a function just because you're a smart person, because you would be underutilizing your own potential. But as you go along that journey, say you've decided this is the space for you or any space for that matter, I'd say another thing that had been has been instrumental in my success is uh, people. You know, I, I I read this article that said eighty five percent of jobs uh, are filled through professional or personal relationships, which is shocking to me. That's a really high percentage, uh, but it also makes you realize the importance of of people in your lives. And the most obvious thing people think of is, oh, I should have mentors, and mentors are good. Uh, but what I found was equally, if not more beneficial, is champions. A champion is somebody who will actually risk their reputation to give you an opportunity to succeed. Uh, they're that manager who'd say, you know, let's give this guy the project. And when you get this project or this lady the project, when you get that project, you should make it your mission to make that person look good because they have basically put their reputation out for you and now you owe them the 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 results that they that you could deliver uh, so find champions find people who will give you these opportunities in 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 work and in life uh, because honestly you're not going to climb up if nobody else is helping you uh, move up the ladder right and you know to sort of wrap all that up the last thing i'd say is measure your success not with the the things that that you want measure your success with the impact that you leave on others so if you're a leader Measure your success in how many leaders you coached, cultivated, and developed, and and their careers and how they are thriving. If 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 you're an entrepreneur, a businessman, don't count your millions. Count how many millionaires you've created in your success. And this way, I think you will have a much more meaningful existence beyond just rising to the top of the function. I think you'll you'll feel like when you've gotten there, it was worth it. Uh, well, that that's about it from us uh, today, Ash. Thank you for joining us for this uh, super cool procurement podcast and uh, look forward to hearing more from you. 
Yeah, absolutely. You too, Gaurav. Good luck in your endeavors. And obviously, if I can ever be of help, you know how to reach me. Thank you. Um, thank you.